All right, welcome back to COG 266. Um, we're going to continue on today discussing the history of mind. Uh, we touched on lots of uh, philosophers and such last time um, for the introduction to mind. This time we're going to dive a little deeper into how this all continues to evolve. So, first, there's a historical problem for cognition. How does information pass from the world to the body to the mind and then back again, right? If we think of the mind as this distinct entity, this distinct nebulous stuff, right? The, the beautiful, strange experience of being a mind, of being a thinking thing. It's tough to figure out how the world and its pieces and parts and its light and such come into our minds through the body. We know a little more about that now that as we've discussed in this class uh, because of the nature of how neurons and receptors work, right? But still, things get more and more abstract the further into the brain they go. So where does this stuff come together? Hassan ibn al uh I probably messed up most of those syllables, but we're, that's where we're going. I, I figure I should do it, try to do it justice. An Arabic mathematician, one of the earliest advocates for our old friend, the scientific method. Um, he comes along and starts to investigate this idea that we already saw last time of the emanation hypothesis. The idea that our eyes are shooting out beams that bring back copies of objects to us, right? He recognized that this was a little bit on the silly side, but he was developing the theory of reflected light. So, science works, woo! <laughs> um, light sources bounce off of objects and hit the back of our eyes as a reflective copy, fl reflected copy. And the idea is that, it, as we know from the retina, it is pointillistic. There are lots of different dots. They get inverted and reversed, so they hit the back because the way they're traveling through, uh, through the, the, the eyeball, um, and they hit the different parts of the retina. And we also recognize that it's only two-dimensional. The retina is flat. There's no depth information. You don't have, if you close one eye, there is no way for you to get from a static image, depth information, right? It, you need both eyes to manage that. So this is a something that is uncovered, but there's a mismatch, right? Okay, so cool, light can hit objects and it can bounce off of them, fine, fine, fine. And it can hit our eyeballs, it can go to the back of the eye and it can turn into an array of dots that is flat? That's the curiosity. That's the trouble, right? Objects in the world aren't pointillistic, inverted, reversed, and two-dimensional. There must be some sort of transformation in the mind that makes these simple visual copies into something that is a more complex visual copy. the scientific method starts to spread and a few hundred years later we start to develop a better understanding of certain things like astronomy, chemistry, physics. They're all coming together across Western Europe. Other places too, uh, unfortunately Western history, we don't talk about that as much because we're jerks. <laughs> um, but the point is that we, the, uh, our understanding of other parts of the world start to come together. And this brings us to a place where the scientific method is being used in this specific way to explain natural phenomena, right? The goal is to figure out some kind of relationship, hopefully mathematical, that you can use to make predictions about the world. And the thought being that genuine physical processes in the world can be explained mechanically, right? So. For instance, the way that the stars, not the stars, I guess, but more the planets move in our, in our sky, it is explainable by, you know, those Copernican principles of how, you know, bodies in space orbit each other, right? So 
there's a mechanical explanation for this kind of confusing process. Every phenomenon is causally influenced by and causally influences other phenomena. Again, no action at a distance, right? Things all are, ha they have to be connected in a, in a meaningfully physical way. So the tree, it's mechanically connected to the image of a tree, which is mechanically connected to our brains, which is our bodies and brains, which is mechanically connected to the thought of a tree, or at least two images of a tree that we can then recombine into our mind's concept of the tree, right? So this is how we're getting to a science around this question. The idea being that there has to be some kind of mechanical step between each of these. Hobbes comes about and pushes this popular idea of motion as geometry into the thought of thought as computation. So motion as, ge as geometry is the idea, like, you know, you can, you can chart the trajectory of, of objects in terms of their, of their geometric shapes that those objects make as they travel in space, right? Simil so he jumps with that to, well, what if thought is just the computation of values, of information? There are internal versions of speaking aloud or calculating on paper, right? So we, we have the ability to work out algorithms out loud or on a pen and paper. He's saying, well, what if there's just these mechanical symbolic processes somehow in the brain? So the motion in this case, the, as geometry, is the phantasms in the brain and they're moved by reason like an abacus. Okay, there's a lot of kind of old timey speak, but I think this paints it pretty decently, right? The idea he's throwing out there is that, hey, what if there's a computer in the brain? What if the brain is an abacus for ideas, right? Not bad. Again, we're always talking from, from the historical perspective as we are getting somewhere. Um, it's not a perfect metaphor. Neither is a computer, uh, which we'll, we'll talk about later, but they are all closer, right? Descartes comes in with a challenging question. What external physical motions turn into internal physical motions? So this is the, his doctrine of corporeal ideas, right? The bodily idea, right? Our minds only have awareness of the states of our bodies which pass through our bodies. The mind is this non-corporeal thing but he's stating that it is, it is a ghost in the machine. When this picture thus passes to the inside of our head, it still bears some resemblance to the objects from which it proceeds. However, we must not think that it is by means of this resemblance that the picture causes our sensory perceptions of these objects, as if there were yet another eyes within our brain which we could perceive it. Instead, we must hold that it is the movements composing this picture which acting directly upon our soul insofar as it is united to our body or are ordained by nature to make it have such sensations. What is he getting at? He's concluding that the mind is actually the one perceiving. It's not the image on the retina itself. There's nothing that observes that image and then makes its own call, but rather the energetic effect that image has on the nerves. He's saying that the image comes in, it, whatever shape it's taking, it, it, but the, the body will move the nerves and then the nerves somehow touch on the brain. Okay, or not brain, the mind. Descartes is, is talking around the concept of how these ideas get into their more abstract forms in the, in the mental space, right? And what, what he's getting at is he's, he's acknowledging that nerves are part of the equation because, hey, technology is starting to get there. We're starting to see what nerves do. Not in a great sense, but we know they exist. And he's coming at it from the perspective of, well, fine, the nerves are in there. They're in the brain. They are, they are the things that interact directly with the mind. Ah. He also proposes grades of sense. Three distinct grades of sense. 
First is the purely mechanical, thoughtless movements. Second is the subjective awareness of states of the body. And then the third is the objective awareness of states of the world. So, what, what's the deal? The idea is that the first kinds of senses are the things that are just automatic. You know, I, we, we detect things from the world and they get into our bodies and that's it. This is the sensory, you know, the sensory receptors, right? We don't really have a choice whether our eyes are going to take light in or not. They just are always doing it. The, I'm translating for him, right? His take on these things was not especially sophisticated because he didn't have access to the tools we do. But that's the idea. So he's talking about the idea of there's information that gets in there just wordlessly. And then there is this sort of mental process, some kind of mental activity that's able to look at the nerves and how they jiggle because of those senses to give us the third sense, which is our ability our awareness of the actual world outside. So he's saying that the mind is hovering somewhere inside, it's watching the nerves, and then the, the, that's the nerves, how they behave, how they respond to the tree outside in the real world. It's able to then detect, ah, I see the nerves are, are wiggling in this way, that means it's the tree. He's doing a good job of kind of partitioning this question of, well, where the heck do we draw the line? You know, if, if it's just a tree coming into the brain, at some point it's gotta become more abstract, right? And he's helping to say, okay, okay, the mind is, is isolated mostly in the way that it understands the world to what it can see of the body of its own nerves. That's not bad. Again, we're, we're, there's no, it, it's, it's more tightly bound to a real observable phenomenon. Uh, and just to recap that, so in his grades of sense, first grade is purely physical. The mindless kinetics of the physical world bumping into one another and we don't, we don't know. The third grade is purely mental. That abstract awareness that the understanding of the world comes into that the ghost possesses, right? Second grade is, is what gives you the interface between those two. So the idea that the mind is monitoring the physical wobbliness of the body to become aware of things in the world. So again, this makes a certain sort of sense. Uh, these graded senses offer this nice compelling take, even if we are ourselves purely mental souls, right? Even if that's, that's the whole, it, that there is, there is mental stuff and it is dualist and it is its own beautiful, unique, whatever mind thing. And it's only directly aware of the goings on in our bodies, we can still make sense of the external world in a consistent way and produce appropriate action. It's just a little indirect. So, so we're seeing the idea of trying to figure out how to bridge the abstract thing that is the mind into the real world, and we're getting closer. It's not bad. And this is mechanizing thought. So this is the time of mechanisms and mathematics for explaining everything in the world. Um, the graded senses need some kind of mathematical notation for them to be taken seriously at this time. Uh, so they need symbols and they need to be able to be abstracted. They don't need to bear a resemblance to, to the meanings that they symbolize. So if mind and matter are distinct, then what's linking them? How do we capture the idea of sense and reason? So, the processes therein, right? He's described these sort of broad overall ways that, that the body, mind, and world interact. We need to start describing, hey, what are the mechanistic properties of those interactions? So let's go down the Cartesian program for understanding mind. Step one, Develop a mechanical account of grade one using physics, biology, and all those such things. So explain to, to us, to, the, to science, how the senses generate information. Remember, we, we kind of, we've begun to see this. The corpuscles, uh, for example, those started to make a certain kind of sense. Um, we didn't, we didn't ha have access to that. That's blurry when these things started to come to be, but commonly understood. But that's the idea. So 
the first goal of the Cartesian program is, hey, let's just talk about how information from the world gets into the body. And hey, that's what we've talked about so far, right? That we have a pretty good grasp of how information from the world gets into the body. Now, step two in the Cartesian program. Identify endowed knowledge that would help grade three interpret and ground what is given by grade two. So this is starting with a question that's a pretty big one. And that is, what is known before we have any worldly experience? What do we come to the table with when we we're born, when we start to develop, all that kind of stuff? And what's the formal structure that represents that knowledge? So, so first of all, what do we have to work with that helps the mind interpret the wiggliness of the body? And second, what, uh, what's the structure of that? Remember, this is the scientific mechanistic approach. We got to get, we got to pin down, well, what does knowledge look like? And then step three are what are the procedures for combining grade two sense, so this, this sort of sense from the, from the mind to the body, with the endowed knowledge that it has to make sense of the world. So step one, to uh, recap, uh, we can combine that. So the mathematical mind is the idea here. Combining all this, the third grade of sense, the one where the mind can detect the world directly, or indirectly, I guess, must have some set of rules for manipulating the symbols that it's pulling out of the wild vibrations of the body. And the idea is that this is a mind that must be a rule-governed mathematical process of reasoning, an abstract algorithmic mind. This should ring some bells if you've ever uh, been in one of these um, intro to cog side courses, for example. This is a precursor to the physical symbol system hypothesis. Long, long, long precursor, but still a precursor. This is the idea that there must be some mechanistic way that we can represent the process of reasoning. There's information in the world. We're doing something with it. We are able to start processing it and make some kind of new information out of what's going on in the world. This is... It's a lot to grasp all at once, um, and there's some issues with it anyway. Descartes' account of the abstract mind is nice, as it's kind of trying to get mind into this mechanistic, quantifiable process. That's new. That's pretty new in the world. But there's a couple of issues. Infinite regress, otherwise known as the homunculus problem, and the paradox of mechanical reason. We'll start with the homunculus problem. So even though Descartes was attempting to avoid the idea of, hey, hey, look, the mind is the, is the, is the real stuff, and um, you know, there's not just an extra set of eyes that's watching our own set of eyes, etc., he still runs into the problem of infinite regress. Who's inside the inner room, right? So remember, we have the three grades here. We have the, my, my mind is able to detect the world, um, my mind is able to detect my body, and my body interacts with the world directly. It's nice to kind of put it in this, this flavor of, you know, it's, there's something inside watching the, the monitors to see what the world has looked like outside, right? Our eyeballs are monitors, and they give somebody else inside a, a way to access the outside world. But... This is a problem because we're trying to talk about how humans mechanically reason, right? What are the mechanistic properties of that? And all we've done is pass the buck along. So if we pass along our sense to the mind for the mind to handle the reasoning, how does the mind reason? All we've done is said, oh, well, someone else inside our heads is looking at these, these pictures, right? Is it going to pass it along to its own internal mind, infinite regress is the issue here. We can't scientifically explain the phenomenon of reasoning by saying that some other central component does more reasoning, right? So the body has the mind inside of it and it passes information to the mind, but what's the mind doing? Is it just passing information to another mind and another mind and another mind? Is this just forever, right? We have failed 
to account for the idea that there must be a place that this stops, that it bottoms out. What is the minimum unit? What is the minimum, you know, what, what is the point at which we stop black boxing the process of reasoning and we start talking about the exact mechanical movements? On top of that, even if we had a homunculus, how does the homunculus attend to the meaning of symbols? Hmm. What do I mean by this? Imagine our mind taking in the information from the outside world. It sees these two different uh, notations, these two different mathematical notations. One plus one is two, that's addition. But we've also seen concatenation before, most of us. One and one can be one, one, 11, but one, one, right? Two, two numbers being concatenated together. Those are both valid ways to use the plus sign. Um, one is more kind of programmery way to do it, um, but the, and one's more mathematical, but the idea is that are the plus symbols in these equations physically different? No, they're identical. They're the same symbol. In fact, the one plus one is the same symbol. And yet these are two different valid interpretations. So the meaning is not coming from the world. The physical forces convey the plus sign in exactly the same way in both scenarios. So if this manipulator, the internal mind, attends to the symbol's meaning, it can't be purely mechanical because it has to choose something, right? It has to select something. It has to figure something out. But if it, the manipulator ignores the symbol's meaning, then it's not doing any reasoning. It's, it's failing to interpret the symbol in its two different forms. These are struggle. The, the, this, is a, this is a tension, right? If it's making an, it's if it's attending something, it's making a decision. Then it, we have to be able to explain that decision. And if it's not making a decision, then it fails to capture the reasoning. Which is it? So, the origin of meaning. Descartes was a religious man, and concluded that the secret of meaning's origin must be due to God. Right. That's good enough for Descartes. He did a lot of work, man. <laughs> So we can, we can let him leave that to, to God, right? But empiricists don't find that satisfying because even if you are religious, why would God be fiddling around giving us all, every individual person meaning when you could use neurons instead, right? So later empiricists still admitted the role of the homunculus. They, they thought that the homunculus is this sort of, internal object, the mind, the, the internal viewer, the manipulator, right? Um, and they, they're still taking that view that there is a, the mental entity, right? But instead, they focus on trying to tie meaning to experience it from the world, right? And we see that a lot. We saw that with Aristotle before, uh, trying to take understanding from the world and pull it in and make it, make it work. So... Enter the empiricist approach. So if meaning is not God-given, then how does the homunculus generate meaning? How does it obtain knowledge? We're still in the man in the room scenario, okay? So consider the homunculus situation, our, our mind guy. Uh, it's sealed up in this house and it can't leave. It lives inside your head and it's stuck there. The only knowledge of the outside world comes from cameras outside, our eyeballs, leading to the screens inside, whatever the registers are for our sensory experience, right? So how does the homunculus decide whether these incoming images are accurate? How much is it to do to the communication system between the camera and the screen, and how much of it is a perfect portrayal of the outside world? That's a pretty major ontological question. Um, what is real? Before we can have meaning, 
we have to know what's real, right? Because meaning is tied directly to, well, if it doesn't mean anything, then it's not, that has no connection to the real world, right? This is kind of the problem when you're learning math in elementary and grade and middle school stuff, right? You are not sure what the meaning is because you're not sure how it affects reality. You're just learning these abstract symbols for nothing. <laughs> At least that's the way we teach it right now. You can, you can tell your old math teachers I said that too. They need to figure it out. Mm. So what is real? The outside world, the images, the wire connecting them, and what's the relationship between all of these different things? If I have to go, if the outside world has to go through the wires, through the images to me, the guy in the room, how am I supposed to connect all these dots? So now we can get into some of these uh, more what can possibly be known type arguments. John Locke argued, we are blank slates, tabula rasa. All knowledge comes from worldly experience. The homunculus is a realist. The homunculus believes that the outside world is real, right? And the goal is to figure out which information occurs consistently outside. Aha, so now we're getting into the, that, those laws of consistency. We're trying to see which things occur together more regularly. Ooh, interesting. Relationships are key. So realism. Knowledge consists of ideas resulting from the sensations. And there are, he poses, and, and this, this take is that there are two types of simple ideas. There's primary qualities, so the features that exist in the world independent of the observer, right? So it's size, so it, you know how many, how many inches is one side of it. It's shape, is this a square or a circle? Uh, it's how it moves, how many there are, how solid is it? Is it squishy or solid or opaque or, you know, all these things. And then there are secondary qualities that have, they're more the things that we uh, impose on them. So the way they interact with us is a little different, right? So we've already talked about how, for example, mantis shrimp see a lot more colors than we do. So when they look at a flower, we see something quite different from them. Uh, well, maybe a mantis shrimp isn't going to look at many flowers, but uh, some seaweed, right? Or bees, they can see different kinds of UV light, right? So they, they see a different thing when we look at the flower. Uh, so either way, these are both kinds of information that we can extract using our senses. And complex ideas arise from combining simple ideas. What would Locke say about that? With these simple ideas, it has the power to repeat, compare, and unite them to an almost infinite variety, and so can make at pleasure new complex ideas. But it is not in the power of understanding of thought to create or frame one new simple idea. So what he's getting at is that there's the stuff that's, that's hard-coded, right? The, the world is going to give us information in specific ways. There's no way to sort of alter the way I see color in the world. What I can alter is the complex versions of, of what I think about the world. So I see that, you know, every time uh, you walk by a green apple, it explodes. I, that's, I don't know. I'm just making something up off the top of my head. But the idea is when I see that, I combine all those basic features that I have, that I have taken in from the world and I combine them into an idea that, hmm, green apples may explode. That's not great. <laughs> Maybe not explode. How about um, more realistic? Got to tie to meaning, right? Um, when I eat this fruit, I, I feel sick, right? So pain receptors from the outside world are combining with my understanding of the object that I, that I ate, and I begin to form this complex idea of uh, that thing is poisonous, I probably shouldn't eat it. Yeah. So that's the idea. Realism is that we trust it, we trust our senses, and we know that the things that are coming in are, uh, are, are real enough for us to work from, and we build all of our knowledge from there, from a blank slate. On the other side of things, we have Berkeley. Berkeley thought 
Hey, the homunculus has no guarantee that the outside world even exists. Anything could be projected on the screens in that room. There's no evidence there's any relation to the outside world. The homunculus must be an idealist. Okay, so idealism. This is the idea that reality is simply the images on the screens and the ideas they produce, and there is no connection necessarily to the real world. We have no evidence to the contrary. Uh, if you've seen The Matrix, this is a sort of a core concept of, hey, the whole world around you could be a fabrication of a neural stimulator that is jammed into the back of your head, and everything is an illusion. But idealism is getting at the idea that you can still interact with that, right? So even though the, there is no guarantee that the world has any real properties that we can observe directly, we are still able to interact with that. So comparing idealism and realism, idealism saying only ideas are real, nothing of the outside world can be certain, so why bother? Realism saying, hey, the, the outside world is the only thing that matters. Everything else is this illusion, and it's all just because us building up from scratch, from tabula rasa. As always, whenever you have wild extremes in science and philosophy, there's usually a more nuanced middle path. <laughs> so here comes Hume. Hume proposes a middle ground. All knowledge has to come to us through the screens. But that information isn't random, unpattered nonsense. So what, the, what he's proposing is that the homunculus must be a skeptic. It attempts to find structure and patterns in the screen's information and then establish a relation with the outside world based on the predictability of those structures and patterns. Am I right to assume that that food that I ate is poisonous? I will test. I will come at it skeptically. So incoming information has consistencies and regularities, even though we can't be sure that everything is real outside of our heads, outside of the, our system, we can still observe the things that are consistent, right? Some will recur at the same times in the same forms, and so we can count on them to be there, count on these relationships that we build and test. So it gives us hope that those things actually exist outside and that we can interact with them. So Hume didn't like the homunculus. Um, what he's, he thought that it's weird to give this special rational agency to um, the, the, this mystical object inside the mind. Um, rather, it's, it's just reliance on sensations and how they combine. So sensory information doesn't need a rational agent to be organized into knowledge. That is a big leap, just so you know. It can instead use the laws of association, similar to laws of physics, to connect things with resemblance, contiguity, causation. Hey, remember our friend Aristotle, right? Because when you start to think about this, you could imagine a machine learning the same things, right? It doesn't have a brain necessarily. It doesn't have the, the beauty of the conscious mind as we know it to be, or at least as we perceive it to be. But it can learn the connections between things in the real world, and it can start to form hypotheses, right? The scientific method as an internal process. Helmholtz tries to kind of pull all of these ideas together to resemble something a little bit more modern. So first he updates Descartes and the, the doctrine of specific nerve energies. Uh, and second, he takes a, a new view on the laws of association. Let's tackle those. So the doctrine of specific nerve energies. The idea here is that regardless of how a receptor is stimulated, it, rep it will produce the same kind of neural response. Responses are specific to nerves, not the stimulation. So what he's getting at is firing rates are the consistent language in neurons, right? So sensations 
as they're experienced in the mind don't necessarily have to resemble the event that caused them at all. This was one of those problems that was tough to solve. Like, oh, how did the, how did the visual thing get, get copied inside the brain and into the mind? The answer is it didn't. It got transformed into neural impulses, which is the language that everything in the brain speaks. So that is the first step of saying, hey, we can kind of do away with this idea that there has to be some kind of special reasoning over different kinds of information and just say, yo, it's all information. It's all neural information. That's pretty good. Then he moves on with the laws of association. So specifying a way for sensations that occur together to become connected, especially in memory. Uh, so specifically three different things. They, they are relative to, related to the things that Aristotle brought us, resemblance, contiguity, and causation. So resemblance, you can associate two ideas that have something in common. For example, an artist's rendering of a flower makes us think of flowers because it has many of the same visual properties, even if it has so much less in common because it's a flat 2D mess of paint smeared on a canvas, it still has shapes that are in common with the, with the interpretations our eyes give us of actual flowers. Also, cats and dogs, uh, we think of them as quite different, but they're both furry and have four legs, so we can relate them as somewhat similar. We can connect them together. The idea of furry four-legged friends is a useful one. You might think of things as pets, as opposed to just, here comes another furry monster, right? <laughs> you can start to categorize things, connect them, see how much they relate to each other and how much they don't. Then there's contiguity. We can associate ideas that are near to one another in time or space. This is, again, very similar to Aristotle's take. The fact that a salt shaker is almost always near a pepper shaker, we start to connect them as a set. You, if you see one, you might think, well, where's the other one, right? That is a more complex object huh, than the single object, the single salt shaker. Just like the salt shaker has a lid and it's full of salt. These are all a complete set of more elementary parts. That's huge, being able to combine ideas like that. Um, also, a flash of far-off lightning is followed by a roll of thunder. We don't think of those things as distinct. Even though it takes a long time for that thunder to get to us, we still know they came from the same uh, event because they always follow one another. Also, the shorter that time is, the more the closer you are to the lightning, which is not a great sign. Get away from it. <laughs> so. The idea of we can connect things as they occur together into distinct concepts. Another example here is you see a dog with a leash, but no person. That's going to throw you for a loop because you're used to seeing dogs, leashes, and people together at all times. You're going to think that's incomplete. Something's wrong here. Some part of your brain will trigger an error, right? And that's because you're able to connect things contiguously. Finally, we have causation. The idea that we can form ideas based on the basic concept that one event can cause another event. Now this one is big, and this is science writ large. Um, it's possible to do it across time, but it's much easier when they're together, right? So getting near a snake seems to cause a lunging bite soon after, uh, which I, is, a, is an idea I might need to use for safety. I'm not always going to, it's not that every time I see a snake, it lunges. It's getting near a snake is an event that causes a lunging bite. We don't want that. So we know how to avoid it. We build this predictive capability by being able to figure out causation. Uh, and then I, as the poison example again, eating certain berries will make us sick tomorrow. Uh, it's a long delay but it, it's an idea that we can use for safety. It might be harder to learn it if we're eating a lot of different kinds of things. We might, might not be sure which thing made us sick, but we can start to narrow that down, right? Through experimentation. Ah, interesting. So what is this giving us? Helmholtz has, has pulled together these ideas to give us a really stable 
understanding. For one, a way a stimulus can enter the nerves as simple information, it doesn't have to be copies, it's just a transformation. We transformed the, the copy of the world that's upside down and inside out on our eyeball into information, firing rates, neurons, yay. We have done away with the mystery of how the representation gets inside the system. And on top of that, it gives us a way for new knowledge to arise exclusively from outside information. For example, X and Y are similar. Y occurs before Z, so Y causes Z. X may also cause Z. A hypothesis, a new piece of information. Interesting. So think about the snake example. I see a snake of a particular color and shape, and I know that if I get near it, it'll bite me. I see a different snake, but it has not the same color and shape, but similar color and shape. Or even maybe not a snake. I see a frog that's brightly colored in the same way that the rattlesnake had bright colors. Ooh, bright colored things might be bad. Maybe I should avoid them. That is our ability to connect the dots based only on worldly experience. That is incredibly useful when we're trying to come up with a mechanistic way to understand the mind. Remember, we're trying to say, how the heck does this thing work? Not just, well, I think there's some mental dude in there somewhere helping out. We're getting away from that. So here's the full version of that. We have a real stimulus in the world. We have the receptor activity at the front end that takes in the stimulus, you know, the light from the stimulus, for example. Then it gets transformed into specific nerve energies, as in it's all in nerves now. So now those nerves become the sensations in some kind of form, right? The, the screens get populated with stuff from the outside world. And then our mental system, that we, as, as such as it were, begins to generate hypotheses and form new memories, associative memories, memories of, oh, that thing has this property. Oh, that thing predicts this scenario. And then we make hypotheses that allow us to test things and generate new information. So even if we have this disjointed, inadequate copy of the world, we also have rules and experience about the world to help us generate these new hypotheses. Aha. So, how do we interact with the world? We gain our understanding through perception. In this view, we perceive the world by forming hypotheses about what the heck is going on out there, choosing the most likely next event based on the current sensory input and prior experiences, all of our memories, right? All the things that we have absorbed from the world. And then we adjust our understanding based on whether or not we were right. You know, if I go near the little frog, maybe it doesn't bite me. So that hypothesis is gone. But maybe I shouldn't eat it either. So. Th this is how we interact with the world made much, much, much more mechanical. We don't have to have a special little guy hanging out inside the brain to make this make sense. But now we may wonder, you know, how, how do we, how does representation exist in just the neurons, right? And that's, that's the key, is we need to understand now how we model the outside world in our neurology. How do we build the structures to help make those predictions that we're talking about here? How do we encode them neurally? Um, so better models of the outside world make for more successful interactions. So we need to understand the processes that allow for that modeling to occur in our minds at all. And that's it. We'll touch on that next time. As always, here's a final thought. Consider what Helmholtz brought of the scientific method into our understanding of the mind. Take existing understanding of the world, generate hypotheses about it, test those hypotheses, and then update our understanding. Think of an example where you have casually used the scientific method in your day-to-day -day life. 
All right, that's it. Thanks. Take care.